Hi everyone, Dominic from the MS Guide here. I'm doing a podcast alongside video interviews these days because it lets me have much better conversations with leaders in the community without worrying about editing them for great visual effects, which is quite hard work. But before I forget, YouTube just keeps moving the goalposts regarding me making any money from it. So it costs me a lot of time and money. So if you can help, then please spare me a little bit on Patreon. The link's in the description. And I really do appreciate your help. I'm a patient like you, and I do this for the community, and your support is crucial, so I do appreciate it. Everything helps if you just click on the subscribe button, ring the bell, give the thumbs up, all that usual stuff. The unknowable algorithm apparently will favor me if you do that. But anyway, today I'm very honored to bring you a guest who epitomizes the role of being an MS patient advocate. They've got a global reputation for helping people with the disease. They write about it. They're fairly well known across the community. I was diagnosed in 1993, but they were diagnosed in 1986 and started on the advocacy path pretty shortly thereafter. So take some time wherever you are to give a little round of applause in your head for Kathy Chester. Hey, Dominic, thanks for having me here. I'm excited to chat with you. Hey, I'm thrilled. I I came to advocacy so late and a couple of years ago, I sort of noticed you on Twitter as it was then and everything. And I just kept thinking, wow, Kathy knows her stuff. You know, everybody seems to know Kathy. Kathy knows every everyone. And then I asked to interview you and you went, oh, yeah, I'd love to. And I thought, oh, that's flattering. <laughs> Why not? You're, you're, you're way up there in the advocacy field and everybody knows you too. And, and, you know, within a shorter amount of time, you just kind of broke that glass ceiling even higher. It's all, it's all different for everyone, isn't it? I mean, it's just, you know, when they talk about, I'm a legend in my own lunchtime, I was, I was <laughs> an extremist, which yeah, is a very constrained bunch of MS people. And I had somebody come up to me and go, how oh, you're him. And I'm looking at them going, I'm who? And it was some doctor from, I can't remember. It was one of the South American countries. And I said, oh, well, I've seen your channel. And I'm just standing there going, oh, that's great. Thanks a lot. Yeah. But... yeah. It, it really is remarkable. Yeah. It, it, it's remarkable at the reach that we get now, you know, with the internet and with social media. It's just remarkable. I, I remember one time I was... Um, working when I used to work for the consortium of MS centers and I was helping to set up a booth for their international organizations of MS nurses. And um, some gentleman was there who in broken English said she, he was from China and he wanted to know how he could set up an MS center in China in his remote area that would be similar to what we had over here. And I thought, oh my God, it's like Dorothy. I am in a different land now because when I was diagnosed, there was no internet and there was no way for people to connect or learn about each other. And so it blows my mind. It blows my mind that I'm talking to you and here I am in the US and you're in the UK and it's just remarkable. And thank God that we do have this now because we can create more awareness mm. around the world. I, Kathy, that's my stock line is when I was diagnosed, there was no internet. People said, oh, what do you do? And I said, well, I didn't start a blog. I did. I mean, I found out I had MS because I read my doctor's handwriting upside down. When you're, when you're in the early stages, there's something gives it away. And I thought, oh, the hermit sign, that's really weird. And I was working as a drug rep back then. And I then went into something they don't have anymore. I went into a library in a hospital, this special medical library. And I thought, I'm going to find out what this is. And I look up the hermit sign and it's a, essentially wasn't looking good from that stage on. And I thought, I found this out in a library with a, with a book. <laughs> and that was a, a book. And in these days, people out with the phone, bing, bing, bing. Right. So that's why I tell newly diagnosed that they're ironically diagnosed at a better time than we were because there's everything is at their disposal. You know, every kind of good information uh, that's sourced is at their you're disposal. You're very, very vulnerable when you've been diagnosed. I say you've had the carpet pulled out from under your feet. I mean, imagine if you're the absolutely, should we say, the typical vanilla person, you are a 
young woman, probably around the age of 30, who probably presented with a visual disturbance. And most people, unless they're in their profession, haven't been near hospitals. And you're just thrust into this, going from something's a bit weird, maybe you're walking, maybe your eyesight, and you're just chucked into this uh, uh, world of sort of smells. And, and I, I, I had a discussion with a neurologist once. I said, and he went, oh, he said, yeah, but it's quite soothing because I'm in an office in, in the hospital. And I went, office, Matt? And he went, well, what, what's wrong? I said, you've got a sharp spin. You've got an examination bed. You've got, just because there's a door on the room and it shuts and, and, and you have a desk. And he's looking at me and I'm going, this is not an office. This is no what regular people spend their that's time. Right. That's right. In an ordinary amount of time, unfortunately for us. But that's, that's also why, you know, when we were diagnosed, a lot of things to me didn't occur to me. And because nobody was talking about it, I didn't know what MS was. There were no MS drugs. There was no internet. And there was nothing, you know, patient centric. I mean, what was that, you know, and creating a medical team? Who do I talk to about that? So it was all really trial and error back then and going to the local libraries and going to the bookstores and finding whatever scraps of information that that you could get. So today is a much better time, it's a funny way of saying it, to be diagnosed with MS because there's so much available out there. And and and, and let's certainly mention the, the, the great M, uh, MS advocates that we know, and there are plenty that, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, but, but these young ones are really uh, uh, incredible doing things that were not available when I first started, you know, 37 years ago. So, Do you know why I started the channel? Yes, and it was a good thing that you did because it was so necessary. And you saw the need for that. You saw the need for that. No, no, no. I, I've got to admit, I, do you know who saw the need yeah. for it? I was chatting to him one weekend about something completely different. It was Aaron I Boster. feel like you're going to say that. And he said, <laughs> he's like, up there. yeah. And I, and I said, yeah, I always tease him and just say, Aaron, you bullied me into this. Look where I am now. But if you didn't have the ability and the capability and the intelligence to do that, you might have heard him say it, but it was, wouldn't have been an aha moment for you to say, hey, I can do this thing. And you did it. So not everybody it could have fallen on deaf ears as well. So give yourself a little credit there. Who's interviewing who here? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You see, <laughs> okay. Kathy, I was thinking before we got online together to speak, I thought you must have been interviewed a bazillion times now about MS. Um, and I wanted to turn it around to you and say, I'm not going to ask you this sort of string of questions, should we say, you know, when were you diagnosed? How did it make you feel? All that kind of stuff. I want to ask you this. What's the question that you wish you were asked when you were interviewed? That's a good question. And I, I was asked it once when I made a video um, for the consortium. And that was, you know, something like, um, if you could tell your younger self what you needed to know about MS, then what would you say? And my answer is always to trust your instincts to be your guide, because nobody asks you that nobody asks you that nobody asks you that those questions about what what how you know what do you know now that you didn't know then what did you need back then to get you started that that, that you weren't told there's and that there's just a plethora of answers for that you know so we could be on here all day but it's a very good question it's, it's not sadly i guess it's just it just is I can answer that so much better now with the opportunity or or the ability to look back over 31 years because like everything i what's experience it's just mistakes you've made and learned from hopefully and you've taken it and you when somebody else says oh your experience it's like i'm just sharing my scrubs so that you don't make them as it's like raising kids in some way you know you you don't want them to make your mistakes. Right. You know they will. And they don't always but... want to listen to you as well. You know, we, we might give our experience. We might give our experience, but someone can take one tiny golden nugget 
of the information that we talked about, that we experienced. And even if they take one little golden nugget from it, they still have learned something. So we can share our stories and see what they can, how they can benefit from it. But I think that everybody in life, and especially with MS, that we learn through our adversities, we learn through our failures, we learn for doing something, oh, you know, you could say, oh, I should have done this, I should have done that, you know. Uh, but no, what happened? It redirected you and it showed you what you should do and it put you on another path because we're all evolving and we're all learning as we go on this journey. And that's what- Mine was really weird because I did not, I did not, I refused to join the train, shall we say, you know, I, I, I just didn't get on the journey. I was diagnosed at 23, sat down with my brother briefly, because you know what it was like back then, every picture was somebody in a wheelchair. Yeah. You know, it was always, it was always, um, you know, the worst case. And, and I, I was a drug rep and I was speaking to a pharmacist that I knew who was one of my customers and I'd just been diagnosed and you know what it's like, it goes through your head every sort of two to three seconds and um i you know and he said oh what's up and i went oh well just been told i've got ms and he stopped and he looked at me and went oh i have two i went you're kidding and he said i said any tips and he said yeah and don't go near the ms society because they're all about nappies and wheelchairs and i thought that was really good advice for a young guy you know you didn't want to be dragged into all this and then i just got on with life and right really to my own detriment sometimes sort of forgot i had it and my big turning point was when i had a massive cycling accident broke my leg badly was bolted back together and couldn't walk i still can't run properly now um and i tried to dart across the road or or my head said oh just dart between those couple of cars and all of a sudden it took one step and my body went that's not happening and now i remember thinking this is what it's like to be disabled yeah. Oh, hang on a second. I am disabled. You know, I'm disabled because I broke my leg so badly. I can, you know, I have to drag it around behind me, but I've also got MS. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what I mean. We're evolving because we're adding all the experiences that we have with this, with the MS, and it's teaching us lessons that we didn't know long ago. And it's teaching us different lessons and um it's be, you know ha keeping us stronger but also keeping us aware as well more compassionate towards other people's plights you know you just i'm way more sympathetic i was i was a sort of right stony hearted 30 year old you know it was just all thrust forward and you know it was just i was there i was going to make money and i was in the dot-com boom and it was all that and it was just right you right. just didn't see and it's not that you actively were against me you just didn't see if, if you like it you didn't make it into your thing you know you're flying around the world doing a job and you know you think one minute i'm in atlanta then i'm in brussels and, and you're in a different world because you're the master of the universe because you're in the dot-com boom and you're and then then all of a sudden you come crashing down to earth with a bump well it's an interrupter you know it jumps in front of us like a steamroller yeah. And it changed the yeah. trajectory of my life too. And I was working in Manhattan. And what were uh, you doing? Well, my first job was uh, what I always wanted to do because I was an English lit major and I, I wanted to work for a publishing house. So I got a great job at McGraw Hill in New York City, right out like two weeks after my college graduation. But unfortunately, I was living on my own. Unfortunately, they paid nothing. <laughs> my grandma was an editor for McGraw Hill back in the day. Oh, I loved that company. It was really great. And I was spiraling upward. But then I, so I went to another job, which was actually in real estate. We were taking um, rental uh, apartments and making them into co-ops mm -hmm. all throughout Manhattan and on the big properties. But it was a lot of work and a lot of running around. And I was ignoring the numb feet that I had. And I was, because I was having too much fun with work and after work that those were in the days of the clubs you know the red parrot and all these. i, I have no idea know. what you mean i've never I'm been fun. to a club or drunk any uh, okay videos. well it was a disco and uh, <laughs> the end of disco thank god but uh, it, it was a lot of fun yeah, yeah. Oh, i have but... to say but i i wa was walking home to catch my bus one day and uh, my shoes came off my high heels my three inch high heels and i didn't even feel them come off my feet because my feet were so numb and i said 
this is time to get to the doctor. I'd previously been in a, 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 a car accident um, six years prior and I had a terrible concussion and I lost feeling in my feet. And my doctor said that my shoes were too tight. So <laughs> I had six years, I was ignoring those feet. But when my shoes came off in the middle of Manhattan and you don't feel it, that's a real wake up call. So I had to leave my job and back then, the doctors told you to, told me to quit my job, move back home with my parents, and um, call them if I had a flare up because they'd give me some steroids. Yeah. And that was, and you weren't supposed to work out. You weren't allowed to sweat. They didn't want your body temperature going up. And um, yoga, I wanted a prescription for yoga. Yoga? Tai Chi? What are you talking about? We're not giving you a prescription for that. They didn't look at complementary medicine at all. Luckily, I was dating someone very seriously who this month we celebrated our 35th wedding anniversary and he stayed with me. Yeah, and actually he's writing for one of the MS websites um, as a caregiver, a care partner, I'd call them. A care partner, yeah, I, I, I know you're sitting in front of me and I can see you, but you don't look like you're in need of a huge amount of care. <laughs> Thank God for filters. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I took Mark Webb somewhere the other day. I don't know if you've seen him on Twitter or something. Mark's in a wheelchair and he's got quite a high. Oh, no, I left that message. I, you, you guys are my two favorite, you know, male influencers. <laughs> and I love seeing you guys together because it's a stitch, but it's very fascinating as well. You know, it, Mark's so funny. And it was, we were talking about it before then we, we're being pushed. We're going in the hospital um, to go for this trial for Mark. Right. And everywhere, I'd push him up somewhere. And it's just like they sort of say in the books, people, I'd push Mark up and he go, I'm here for the trial. Yeah. You know, and they'd look up at me and start talking to me. And I just said, hey, don't talk to me. I'm just the chauffeur. <laughs> and, uh, and and they're going, I'll get a kiss. I thought, yeah, I'm getting pissed off on your part yeah. you know but on your behalf and he's like oh you have to i'm going yeah but i see how annoying it is it's like no no talk to the yeah. man you know he's talking to yeah you. people and, have um, a way of doing that he holds up his i don't understand that you know they do it especially to the elderly but if you're in a wheelchair i've seen that happen a lot and it's very irritating mm. uh, to say mm. the least so we need to create more awareness around that as well it's yeah, well, I just, you know, I try to call it directly. That yeah. Jason just went, don't talk That's to me, right. talk to That's him. That's right. You know, because he's just, it's annoying. But yeah, it's just Mark so sort of hopped himself into the car <laughs> and he's got his bum on the seat. And then he's just going, you'll have to put my legs in. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. And I'm down and I'm like, don't tell me if I'm, he says, doesn't matter. I can't feel I'm just bend away. I'm like, oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> and, uh, Only we can laugh at that, you know. You know? <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, for sure. It was, um, there was another time when, uh, uh, I was pushing Mark. It, it was at, at some event and, um, it, it was at PWC or something, one of these big consultancies. And he said, where can, uh, where can we get some coffee? And I went, oh, well the bloke over there is doing me a cripples discount. And, um, oh, I hate that and, word. Uh, Oh yeah, well, this is why we just sort of—it's like the owning it. It's like owning the word "gay" or something, you know. It's just, um, you know. And Mark started laughing, when, and there was the woman standing there from the agency went, "You can't say that." And it's like, yeah, we both are, and um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but it's just we're the only ones that can say it. If that makes sense. Oh, it, it does make sense. I I, I agree, but ugh, it's a new word, new hey, world. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, half of it's the shock value, and it's half of it is just taking the sting out of the word, if you will, you know. But we're the only ones who are allowed to do it. But um, yeah, yeah, it's that's uh, like when we tried to change know. from handicapped to disabled, which I thought was a smart move, you know. So yeah, yeah, handicapped. Well, it's like being wheelchair bound. It's like mm, bound sounds mm. like it's some sort of you've had a spell cast on you, and you can't, you know. What if some people use it? got a friend in washington and she you know she can walk using a rollator but a wheelchair but a scooter but she said there are different ways that i choose to make it so i can navigate through life right. you know and right. um, it's uh 
I'm not bound to something. Right. I choose to do it because it makes my life easier. Right, right. Well, I, you know, some people say it's just a matter of semantics, but I disagree. Words are very important in how we use them and, and, and the collection of words that we use. It's very important. And it's important to us as, as a community to be able to use and, and to make others know to use the right word. I was asked once to write an article, I forget who it was for, about the words that we'd rather have used. And um, it was well received. You know, you start creating these campaigns of awareness, it, it helps somewhat, hopefully on a bigger scale. Yeah, I, I agree. And it's also, there's always a, like everything, the flip side is there's some people who seem to me to be, I think it comes from being angry and I get that, but they're determined to take offense. You know, they make everybody walk around them like they're tiptoeing around on broken glass, you know, and it's just, um, I also think I try to cut people slack because my view is that 99.9% .9 of the people are not on purpose saying what I would call the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't know how to say something properly. They're not sure. They're also awkward. We expect, oh, we've got MS. And then there's this expectation that you should immediately understand everything that that entails. Right, right. And, and, it's, be you know, and when it's because this is our focus. And we, we read about it and we talk about it and we chat about it and we try to change things about it. But normally people that are, are able-bodied are not thinking about it 24 seven. And, and that's where it becomes an educable moment where you teach somebody. I was at the airport yeah. a couple of years ago and there was a mother with her two young kids. And you know, I was being pushed in the wheelchair to go get my, to go um, get, go to the gate. Were you in a wheelchair? At the airport, I go in a wheelchair. What? Oh, right, I see too. too far yeah, yeah. for me. And so we get somebody yeah. to push and my husband's with me, you know. So we get to the gate and they start calling our uh, our seats and the, you know, disabled people go first. So I heard um, the mother say in front of the children, oh, she's probably faking or something like that. <clears throat> and I told the ooh, woman ooh, pushing ooh. my chair to stop me and back up. And I said, very calmly, <laughs> I said, this is an educable moment, not only for the mother, but particularly for the children. And I explained to them why I need the chair and what, you know, what MS is. I didn't want to do it for long because, you know, you're going to lose their yeah. ear. And um, I felt gratified by it. I don't know. She could have bad mouthed me as soon as I walked away. But I felt that that moment, if I had walked away and not said anything, it would have stayed with me forever. So you yeah, have. Yeah. yeah, I mean that that sort of stuff. I I I just I don't have a problem with assertiveness. You know, I, like you said, I don't want to be aggressive or yelling, but I will turn around and smile sweetly and say, perhaps I can help you understand. Yes, exactly. <laughs> And that works it's, better. Uh, which is my that works better. Yeah, You're yeah, right. yeah. Because it, it's um, you know, not everything as it seems. You know, I said you can't see the COVID virus, but it doesn't mean it's not there. And uh, That's a good you know, it's just all quite, yeah. I'm still testing positive. I'm coming off the back. I was going to ask you how you're COVID. feeling. How are you feeling? Not bad at all. I mean, given from me that it's half past four in the afternoon, four thirty, it, it's um. I've been up since seven. I'm sort of, you know, knock it on, you know, I'm not taking my Paxlovid, so I don't take my uh, modafinil when I take my Paxlovid. Right. <clears throat> and then um, I've got a little bit of a chest infection, but, you know, aren't I lucky to live in the first world where 32 hours after testing positive, I have Paxlovid delivered to my house by a courier Yeah, because I'm on, you know, the at-risk register, you know, having MS and, I just ring up and report it to the centralized number. I I grew up in Canada. I know how different the healthcare systems are, but and the, this is it's far from perfect. But boy, oh boy, am I so grateful when it's a, a centralized medicine system like this. When they say, "What's your NHS number?" and you tell them, and it's like, "Okay, Bing," you know, you're there. You've got MS. You know, you've taken these drugs. Your full medical history. You know, and that wouldn't matter whether I was in Newcastle or or New Haven or, you know, it's just if I'm in England, that's it. Right, right, right. Well, we're very privileged to be able to have that and to have a healthcare system that will allow us that, you know, as we know, mm -hmm. we know how expensive MS drugs are. 
But when we get COVID, we're very privileged to be able to get it delivered to your house, which not everywhere does that. Exactly. So, and if hey, fun fact I learned the other day. So cladribine that's made by yeah. Merck, when it's being sold for cancer, it is in this in the UK, it is one fifth of the price of exactly, exactly the same thing as it is for MS. Because I don't blame drug companies for wanting to make money, but MS drugs, they seem to manage to jack the money up on them right, left and center. Absolutely. I'm sure I'll be off Mark's Christmas card list for saying <laughs> this, but it's just, uh, you know, it, it's, but they're not alone. You know, it's not as if they're the one, one lot of people that are doing right. it. You know, we're having, you know, it's just, uh, and the sad thing is we MS patients, if we're on a chronic medication, I mean, say you're on, I don't know, off a tumor map, uh, you know, casimta, or right. you know, things like this. We are good money for the drug companies. Oh yeah. Companies. And they and know it. And they know they have us over a barrel too. I mean, it, look, I've worked for many pharmaceutical well, companies. Can... I don't want to bad mouth them because they're doing great. And well, no, but the money, the money yeah. for the uh, medications is 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 exorbitant. And some people, you know, I mean, I'm on a grant for the one that I have, and um, thank you very much. I really, you know, it helps me. And uh, yeah, but <laughs> I remember many years ago, um, some. Um, writer for the New York Times called me because he wanted to talk about the prices of MS drugs. That was about 10 years ago mm -hmm. because he thought it was just out of control. And he wrote a really mm -hmm. great article on why it's so expensive and how this can be and what about the people that can't afford it or that don't have insurance or whatever. It was a great article, but as we can see, nothing's changed. So. <clears throat> yeah. But I said to people, somebody was going on about it uh, in the scientific community. I said, have you ever listened to the earnings calls of the drug companies? As I said, they are, you can access them as the public. And if you listen to the earning calls in the US, um, patients who are on chronic medications have a value attached to them, which is great for the company because they can make this forward projections. They know that there's no generic coming in until point X in the future. They can say, I've got this many people on it. It's growing at this rate. And the average length of time on the drug is, is why. So therefore we know, I mean, you can just imagine just being able to count your money sort of ahead of time like that. And then tell you, tell your shareholders, don't worry. It's okay. This is what's happening. And this is what's going to happen. And unless the world blows up, this is what we're going to have in six months, 10 months, you know, two years right. time. It's, it's, it's amazing just from a purely technical business point of view. I'm not arguing the rights or wrongs, but right. that's a pretty nice place to be. Uh, I don't know yeah. where, I don't know where if, to go from there. The company, I agree if, with you, if, but I don't know where to go from there. Yeah. It's frustrating well, and it's, but it's a double edged sword. I mean, yeah, yeah, but they research and they drive, um, you know, and, and they, they help people and they give grants like you've got and stuff and they give discounts to the NHS because it's all this. So this, it's a double edged sword. I don't like it when somebody just bad mouths pharma as if it's just one big nasty chunk. Right. And that's why I, I shy away from some of a lot of groups that I used to do maybe 10 or so years ago because everybody's saying negative things that you know, about the big pharma that they, they're in business, they're not going to find a cure because they can make more money, but they are doing such, I oh. know, and it drives me crazy because, you know, read a little bit more and, and spread your wings and find out more because that's not all it's about. And also they are doing wonderful initiatives in so many areas for our community that is so beneficial and, and I, I'm proud to have been part of many of them. Uh, and they're wonderful mm. people who are truly dedicated to to us. And so it's you know I, I'm I'm not trying to paint a Pollyanna picture of them as well. But that said, there yes, it's two <laughs> there's two sides. And um and 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 I know for my generation there won't be a cure. But who was I? I read somebody recently, a doctor, a reputable. Cartier. 
Is it about CAR T cells and they call it you CAR T? You mentioned the word cure, which nobody, which everybody stays away from, and for good reason. And he seemed to think that yeah. there will be something in the next generation. And I am hopeful with all the research that's yeah. come out. Look at a whoosh, all the research that's come out since we've been diagnosed, you know, over 30 years ago. Can you imagine? The drugs. I've had my all of them. One. I mean, so, oh gosh. You know, there were none when I, when I was diagnosed like you nothing. there's nothing they just went oh well so we'll yeah. give you steroids yeah. if you need them it was a it was a joyous uh, occasion <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, what, i don't know if, do you know the big thing for me was having alamtuzumab lemtrada because it was suddenly like i am no longer beholden to a hospital uh -huh. i don't have to go in you know it's sort of like done dusted you know, after round two, it's like, thank you very much. Sure, I need right. blood tests. What was your first drug that you but, went on? Oh, yeah, I've gone Rebif, Capaxone, uh, Tecfidera. I was on the Tecfidera okay. trial. And um, then Ocaluzumab, Ocrevus, and then Lemtrada, which is yeah, which is um, Alamtuzumab. You know, we use the generic names generally more than the brand names. So I'm trying to throw the brand names in because that's what certainly in the US, you know, it is, is used even by the doctors often. Yeah, they do. And I think some people you know, are being, you know, you're always Googling, which one's that one? Which one's that one? You know, and, it, and it's not easy to remember all of them. Uh, I think we need a, we need a no, glossary no. book for all the terminology that we need to know once we're diagnosed. Like, I, first of all, I think comorbidity, I think, I think that word should be changed, but, you know. <laughs> what you mean because because i'm older i i have a comorbidity of my age is yeah, about 50 yeah, you know yeah. and it's uh, yeah i i don't know but there are certain words when the when the doctors talk there are certain words that everybody's going to say what does that mean and if we had like a, a glossary a book a glossary book hmm. of all the terms i know you can do it on google so we really don't need a book but you know yeah no, no, no. But you know, I, I, I do like yeah, the book. I like, and uh, yeah. or even something you could download to mm -hmm. your Kindle. But it, it, you, you're right. It's, I mean, you just pick it up yeah. as you go. You know, I remember. You know, I, I, I was a drug rep. My first girlfriend was a was a researcher, and stuff. And you know, and then you know, other friends are there. Yeah, you know, and also you just you're just dropped in this world, and sort of slowly, it's almost like I don't know learning another right. language you you just pick right. it up and you have and to don't really realize you're picking really, it up. you know uh, who knew when yeah. we were when we were teenagers that our children that one day we would have to learn this whole other vocabulary different than what we were learning in our primary schools you know so um but there you go hmm? i i did not i could not get my head around a hashtag you know the whole sort of um you know, internet yeah. vocabulary, BRB. Yeah. I'll be yeah. right back. Yeah. And, you know, I used to and, look them up, and, and, and right? LOL. And then like an Urban Dictionary. Oh, yeah, you look then, them up. But yeah. 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 Urban Dictionary. And then it's like, and then it's always like everything goes, oh, and there's this thing. You're going, oh my, I'd never heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess that's good for our cognition that, that, because we're accumulating all this vast amount of new there knowledge. You go. Yeah, you know, yeah. So yeah. there's always that. But and you read something and think that, that sounds terribly athletic. Why would you want to do that? And, <laughs> but no, I, I oh, it, it's just, but Kathy, what's been the one, have you had any real sort of change? Like you said, for example, 10 years ago, you know, that people going on oh, big pharma, big pharma, which I would say to somebody, can you explain what big pharma is? And then that obviously nobody can give you the same answer. And so you so, Big pharma is what you wanted to be. It's the big evil thing, shadow in the corner, right. isn't it? But you know, has there been any big change in your view, in your outlook, in what you think should happen, what you think shouldn't happen? Um, you know, you've got the ability to reflect and see where the roadblocks are, or like you said, the word comorbidity should be put put to a gentle gentle death. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I I think it would be nice, you know. Um, one time I met Alan Alda, 
not like he was my buddy, but I went to a talk and I met him for five whole. Oh, well, that's pretty. That's pretty. He's a hero. Here's oh, a hero, he's a of, mine, hero you know? of mine. And I knew that I would be meeting him at a cocktail yeah. party afterwards. So I started thinking, what can I say to him that's not going to sound like, oh, I love your work and I loved Hawkeye and you're doing the blah, 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 and you've been married <laughs> for so long and I love that. But you know, what can I say? So at the time, he was starting a new school with Stony Brook University. And it was a school for communications, which he's very big on. He's a very science-minded guy and also communications. And he was teaching uh, uh, students um, and, and, and a lot of, he was talking about a lot of these pre-med students too, what, how he was going to teach communication to them. And so what I said to him is, I have MS. First thing I said, which was a dumb thing to come right out and say, and he went, oh, God, I'm so sorry. I'm like, no, 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 don't be sorry. I just... I'm telling you for a reason. I hope that at Stony Brook, you could teach the students, especially the med students, how to talk to patients and how to learn how to talk to patients and how to communicate diagnoses to them in a way that they can better understand and to prepare them for the next steps forward and that they can have a real dialogue with them, which is not taught in medical school. Uh, maybe the younger doctors are, like Aaron Boster is, you know, he, in my mind, if, no, he's an outlier yeah, the data he set. is, and he should teach that, that course at Stony Brook. But, um, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, um, and that's what I think. I think that when we are diagnosed, we should be given a toolkit that's different than what I've experienced. And of course, I know things have changed since 1986, but I mean, given a toolkit about how to mental wellness and how to put together a great a, medical a team. Newly diagnosed What's that? Pack. A newly diagnosed exactly. starter pack. Exactly. Of Some kind of kit, however they want to construct it, that will give the patient, have them walk away with a feeling of, okay, I got this diagnosis and it's, it's not great, but I know that I can survive this because I have this, 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 and this in my corner. I can take this, this, and this action forward. And I, I know that I have safe place to fall with this organization or with these advocates or whatever. And that's what I would like to see change, which I think is what your question was. I can go get a bit talky there sometimes. Yeah, no, yeah. No, no, I think that's a perfect answer because it's, you know, being able to look back and change and, or, or, or say what we'd like to see. It's funny, I had this conversation more than once with, with sort of friends. I, I say, people like you and me, I say, we're in the MS yeah. mafia. You know, we're, we're, we got we're, plastic um, gloves. Oh, you know, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, no, no. But also, some people think you haven't, remember when you were diagnosed, it was like, stop your job, move right. in with your parents, all this. You know, it was like, take yourself out of society in some ways. And whereas now, plenty of people, I have friends who, I have somebody who runs the emergency department in a hospital. I have I have a friend who's a banker. I have friends, you know, you know, do all kinds of things. You know, kind of MS as an adjunct is not it's not their lead thing in their life. You know, it's something in their life, and it's an annoying thing, and it's something that binds us together right. in many ways. But, but it's not the only thing. And I, I mean, I really like to help people. Just you know. It it is and it isn't going away, but it can't be everything. You know the people that I say they live in their disease, and it comes into the room sort of half a second before they do, and and you're never unsure that this person has right. MS because they'll tell right. you, right? You know whether you whether you want them to. I mean, I've done it before. You've done it before. You know, like, Alan Alda, I've got MS. Right? I've said to people and thought, not my best opener, but you can't yeah. take it back. But you learn not to. You know, I don't know. It's in your head far more then than it. I mean, now we're talking because we have it, but I don't feel that we're talking because we're, you know, we're not sort of holding hands, so to speak, going, this is awful. What are right. we going to do? But, you know, when I went from that sole practitioner neurologist that, and, uh, that diagnosed me and he told me to get to an MS center and they were just brand new in those days. So I went to a center where mm. they did everything under one roof for the patient, for the family, you know, and, um, and, and that nurse practitioner was the one that said to me, do not let MS be the sum total of who you are. And that 
was what I, that's what I live by, and that's the, that should be part of part of the toolkit that these newly diagnosed patients get to let them know that yeah, they got a bum diagnosis and 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 grieve or do whatever you need to do. That's for sure, but it's not the end of your life, and you can still have this great life within your abilities. It might look a little different. You might have to take a different tack. But to be able to, to know that, that's empowering and it's inspiring. And it gives you a different mindset than the quit your job, move home. It's like the negative. No, 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 no. Instead of let's give them a little yes and a little maybe and a little, a lot of inspiration. And that I think would put somebody on, on a better track than, than what I had way back when. Oh, oh, for sure. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's good, but it's also, I think that sometimes you want some people, it, you and I know it's there, but you kind of got to look for it sometimes. It doesn't all fall in front of you. But like you say, if there was a, a pack or something, they sit in the hospital, look, you know, um, what, what did you say? It's a bum diagnosis. My phrase is it sucks to be you, <laughs> but I like, you know, it's a bum diagnosis, you know, it's, um, but and and I think you you can't change that. You can't change what happened ten minutes ago. But you know, it is what it is. I mean, my pet thing these days is I wish I was really quite annoyed by a nurse, and she wasn't doing it on purpose or being mean or anything. But I said, you know, she really explained to people, not frighten them, but you, you need to give them context now about what's coming down the pipe. Because I think if I had a better idea when I was diagnosed of what was likely to happen, you know, that would have affected the way I did certain things in my life. And, uh, you know, the way now it would affect the way I pursued drugs um, for mm -hmm. it and stuff, because it was Klaus Schmirer who said, Prof Schmirer who said, you know, 90% of, uh, of, of us with MS won't get through unscathed. 10% is going to be lucky, right. but you don't know That's if you're right. in that 10%. And you'll never know. You know, it's a bit like Clint and you'll never know. Yeah. Well, you kind of got to assume you're in the ninety yeah. percent, unless unless you're just one of these. Um, I I I find that kind of sort of optimism slightly misguided. You know, I just think be realistic. You've got a nine out of ten chance that it's like crossing the freeway blindfolded. You might get winged, or you might get run down by a semi, and the occasional person makes it across without right. being hit. Right, right. But, but but you're blindfolded, so good luck. And um. But I, this nurse said, oh, I don't want to tell them that. I don't want to scare them. And I said, it's not your job to scare them. I said, but it's your job to inform them. And I said, I don't know. You know, it should be treated as an acute condition. These days we have the drugs to say we can get straight right. in to this. You know, there was a guy told me the other day he was told to come back when he was falling over. And you think, oh, that's just that's that's just shocking. You know, it's just how can you as a doctor do that to somebody? You know, it, it's your communication thing. There's no empathy there. You know, it's when that person's falling over, they've suffered damage to their brain that you can never right. undo. That's right. And that's right. You know, and and so uh, whereas I think cancer nurses have to find out if you're, I'm telling somebody they have a, a form of cancer, which is really dangerous. I've got to have the words which aren't go away and come back when you can feel your tumors. It's right. We have to do something now because your chances are going to be best uh, uh, made the best by doing something now. Right. That's right. We, we should, we need, we need to be more authentic and more explicit, not explicit in some ways, but more authentic for sure, because this is our life and we are living it. And so why shouldn't we know what the absolute truth is? Sure, it's unpredictable, and we don't know from one day after another what's going to happen. But at least we should get the facts, and we should be armed with information. And that, and that's um, unfortunately not always um, available to us when we first begin this crazy trip that we're on. No. Yeah. No. Hey, Kathy, we've been chatting for forty-five minutes. Holy I mean, moly. on that note, I think i know it is uh you said you could go yeah. all day but um frankly i'm not sure <laughs> i could <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> you know but it's um i think that's a really important note to end on because you know we've come a long way but there's still a lot to do you know and 
I think two things, like you said, making making all the information available there and call it a starter pack um, for want of a better you know, phrase. But also I think, and as you, I think I read it properly, back me up on the fact that don't sugarcoat this. You need to tell us all the facts. It's our life. You know, it's not the neurologist or the nurse's life. It's our life that we are facing this incurable disease. So therefore you owe it to us to say, these are the unvarnished facts. That's right. And that's why I think that in, in med school or somewhere along the line, that that should be taught. I mean, you can only teach empathy and compassion so much, but you could teach communication skills absolutely early on. And that's really necessary 